Hello and welcome to State Matters. I'm your host, Matt Miratori. Since 1965, South Shore Community Action Council, a private not-for-profit organization, has provided a range of critical services to low-income individuals and families on the South Shore. Today, we'll be discussing the many programs and services they provide with the outgoing Chief Executive Officer, Jack Cochio, and the incoming Chief Executive Officer, Lisa Fields. Good. Hello, everybody. How are you? Doing well. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for uh, for joining me today. And I, I I know you were you were with us on a show two or three years ago, um, but we really wanted to bring you back to talk about the the transition, and and really um, to highlight some of the things that you are doing and what you're looking to do in the future. Um, you know, particularly as we talked before we got on air. Uh, opera funding, and, and I think that's a game changer for your organization and for the community at large. And so we'll, we want to chat about that as well. But before we do, um, Jack, let's start with you since you are the outgoing uh, chief executive officer. First of all, uh, thank you for not only what you, you have done all these years for South Shore Community Action Council as the chief financial officer, chief executive officer, but what you do in the community as well. You and I are Rotarians together. I know what you do in the community, and we really appreciate right. all you've done. And and hopefully you'll stay involved with our community as well. But tell people who don't know who Jack is, you know, a little bit about you and your background and, you know, what you've been doing. All right. Well, I'm a South Shore boy. I grew up in Quincy, went to Quincy High, went to Northeastern University, got uh, my CPA exam out of the way, went into public accounting, uh, became a partner in a firm in Boston, loved it there, worked there for about 20 years. Uh, and then started to move into nonprofits. I worked at Eastern Nazarene College as the uh, uh, as a chief accountant, and then uh, came down here to the South Shore to Plymouth as the CFO, chief financial officer, and have enjoyed it. Been here for 21 years, and it's been uh, an exciting opportunity for me. I've loved the uh, the organization. I love what we do love helping people, and uh, it's been a, a great time for me. Very so, enjoyable. So what drew you to South Shore Community Action Council 21 years ago? What drew me? You know, uh, <laughs> it's interesting how things work out. I was uh, looking to make a move. I wasn't sure where, and I saw this little tiny ad for a CFO in Plymouth. And I'm like, yeah, this isn't going to work out. <laughs> uh, but I do a lot of praying and I ask for guidance. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came down and interview with the CEO at the time, Pat Daly. Yeah, love Pat um, Daly. Yeah. Things just fit in perfectly. And uh, it obviously was a good move for mm -hmm. me. And uh, we've enjoyed the the organization tremendously during these years. And you don't usually see CFOs uh, going to CEOs. So what 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 attracted you to do that? Usually CFOs kind of stay in their lane. Well, sometimes, you know, it was an interesting time. This was about four and a half years ago. Uh, there was a lot of things going on, especially Trump had just come into power and was talking about really uh, cutting out 100% of the LIHEAP program, the Low Income Heat Assistance Program, and weatherization. And he was talking about taking everything off the board. And uh, that combined with a change in leadership just didn't sound appealing to me. It, You know, people get very uh, antsy when there's a change in leadership and you get nervous. And I was very concerned that people were going to be even more nervous because everything that was coming down from the feds at that time. Lisa and I talked about it and I was asking Lisa to, to, to apply for the position and she was talking to me about me applying for the position. She finally talked me into it and then uh, applied for it and the rest is history. That's great. That's great. Well, I, I guess, you know, there's something that came out of the Trump administration good for, for Plymouth, at least, having you as a CEO. <laughs> so that's exactly. terrific. That's terrific. <laughs> All right, Lisa, let's let's chat with you a little bit. Um, talk about who Lisa is and your background and, and what brought you here. Thank you, Matt. Um, well, my background is I um, uh, grew up in Maine originally, but um, came to Massachusetts for college, um, attended Wheaton College uh, in Norton. Um, in the 80s and uh, 
South Shore was my first official uh, non-college job. So I've been with the agency since the 1980s and um, started off as the agency planner, which is kind of, um, you know, getting a handle on all the programs that the agency offers and, uh, you know, writing a work plan of what, what we um, propose to do as an agency every year and what our outcomes will be and so forth. Um, and then there was the opportunity to become involved in the energy programs and um, the fuel assistance program and the energy conservation programs, weatherization and the burner repair program. So, um, so that's what I moved on to. And uh, as Jack mentioned, under Pat's leadership, um, Pat, uh, began a food resources program and which eventually transitioned to our current food resources warehouse. And um, so I uh, gained that responsibility as well. And um, then uh, probably about five years, six years ago, um, there was a, um, the prior CEO, Pat, um, determined that we really should have a deputy director position at the agency. So I applied for that and have been the deputy director um, for six years now. That's terrific. So, and how many employees are there, Lisa? I am. You have about 205 100. to 220, yeah. okay. somewhere in that vicinity. So okay. pretty big organization. Okay. Our budget's a little bit over $25 million. Wow. Well, this past year. It, it's bigger than what people think, because I think people, you're located on Overy Street um, across from the, uh, the courthouse and the Registry of Deeds, and I think people see that and think it's a small organization, but it's really much larger organization. Uh, so let's get into that a little bit. Interesting, though, I, I love doing the backgrounds of people, because I always seem to find something in common. Uh, Jack, I went to Northeastern as well, and Lisa, I was born in Caribou, Maine, so, so there you go. Oh. <laughs> so let's let's get let's get into the um, um, you know uh, and, and either one of you could take this question you know what is explain the organization of social community action council and, and how is it made up uh, I know I said as I said in the open it's a not for profit so you must have a board so if you could talk about the makeup and then we can get into some of the specific programs you have uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the specific geography and what our mission is. Our mission, in a nutshell, is to eliminate poverty on the South Shore. South Shore is a big area. And really, we start from Situate, Hull, and we go down the Route 3 card all the way to the bridge. And then we go to, on, on to Cape Cod in Nantucket, the islands, Martha's Vineyard. We do the low-income heat assistance program for all of those areas. And many of our programs cover right up to the bridge as well. So, uh, and Lisa, you can probably talk about how once you apply for the the fuel assistance program, how people can get tuned into other programs as well. Sure. Um, well, we, as you uh, pointed out at the beginning, Matt, fuel assistance we consider uh, uh, one of those one-stop shopping programs um, when a household. Uh, and, the, and the income guidelines to apply for fuel assistance might be higher than, than some people think. And I think um, one of the negative marketing um, issues that we face with fuel assistance is that people perceive, because it's called LIHEAP, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, that um, they might have a preconceived notion of what we mean by low income. But for example, a household of two could make up to $53,551 and still be eligible for fuel assistance. A household of four could make up to $78,751. Um, there's uh, an income guideline chart on our website um, at www.sscac.org. Um, that people can access and, um, you know, fuel assistance provides not only assistance with uh, primary heat bills, um, and this year the guidelines are, are pretty um, very helpful. Uh, they range from about $810 to $1,650 of assistance. We pay 
uh, the vendors directly, the heating vendors directly. We have about 140 heating vendors, um, everything from oil vendors, wood dealers, propane, kerosene, natural gas, electricity, um, wood, coal, um, whatever a mm. household's primary heat source is. Um, when they're eligible uh, and they incur bills between November and the end of April, um, we'd be able to assist with uh, payment of those primary heat source bills. And that uh, eligibility for fuel assistance will provide a household with 12 months of discounts for on their electric bill or their natural gas bill. Um, so that's a pretty significant, um, it's about a 30, 35% discount every month on their um, utility bill. Other services that we offer here that um, fuel assistance eligibility provides access to are weatherization. Um, that's, uh, we have energy auditors that go into clients' homes and assess the, um, any need for insulation, um, other air sealing measures, um, and it could be a significant um, you know, the typical weatherization job is over $4,500 in, in uh, insulation and air sealing measures. Um, we also have a heating assistance repair and replacement program, and we're able to do a variety of things, um, including uh, re replace an entire heating system at no cost to the client. Um, if uh, a household's in need of a new oil tank, uh, we're able to do that. Um, minor repairs for an existing heating uh, system, um, clean and tunes, typically in the spring and summer, um, once a year. So it's um, really key to, if a household thinks they're eligible, just by looking at the income guidelines, um, we're able to take applications through uh, during the pandemic on our online portal, which is found on the website at www.sscac.org. Um, if you're more comfortable with filling an application out over the phone, that's another uh, probably the only only benefit to the pandemic is that the state now allows um, individuals to apply online through the portal, or they can call the agency fuel assistance at 877-FUEL-AID toll free, or 508-746-6707, and um, you know, fill out an application over the phone. Um, and, so the key, uh, Matt, yeah. is to, for them to get in touch with us yes. and yeah. get an application in, because if you are eligible, uh, it gets you, it's like an open door for other pro, many other programs that we have as well. Right. And sometimes an individual may not be eligible, but we really hate to turn people away. Mm -hmm. We might be able to help people with food, gift cards, and other programs as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. the key is get, get in there and get your application right. in so that we can find out how we can best help you. Yeah. Jack, before we go on to other programs you have, can you talk a little bit about the structure of your organization? And do you have a board of directors and how that all works? Yeah, it's a tripartite board. There are 21 uh, board members, seven from, uh, they represent the different towns that we do services in. And um, so we have lo low income individuals, representatives. We have board of selectmen representatives and uh, third category as well. So uh, it's pretty broad and um, individuals from the different communities that really have a heart to help people that might be in need. Uh, they get familiar with the programs and what we do. Very often we'll get a, a, an email from the individual that's on our board that says, hey, I've got a, uh, somebody in my community that needs some assistance. Can you help them? Matt, I know that over the years you've gotten in touch with us and said that Here's somebody that maybe you could help, uh, and uh, we're always happy to help people. 
as yeah. much as yeah. we and I always tell can. people it's one stop shopping there. I think you guys, you, you folks have been terrific really over is. the years. You really are able to help people, as you said, even if they're not eligible, you're able to help them somehow. Jack, you talked about your, your budget is about $250 million. I would assume a good majority of that is from the government, mostly federal government. 25. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm at 25, 25 million. Sorry. Million. Yeah. I'm sorry. 25 million. Yeah. <laughs> I assume most of that is from the uh, the federal government. Maybe some from the state. Do you also do fundraising as well? Yeah. Yeah. It's a probably about. Um, it's been in the past about 70 and 72 percent was the federal government. I think it's gone down a little bit this past year, uh, and the state is a pretty good percent, uh, 15 percent or so. And we've received a significant amount of additional funds from the community donations and whatnot. Uh, the community has really stepped up. Uh, banks and uh, just organizations have been giving us money and saying, listen, just use this any way you see fit to help people that have been affected by the pandemic, which is just about everybody. Yeah, right. Um, so yeah. Uh, it's been great. They've, they've really opened the doors for us and given us uh, significant funds. And the federal government has given us more money because of the pandemic that we've been able to use to help people with uh, rent and mortgage assistance, uh, you know, just so many different things that we've been able to help them out with that the federal government hasn't really put uh, the as much regulations behind these dollars as they normally do. They've been much looser realizing that the funds have to move quickly exactly. in order to help people. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Lisa, I, I know a big part of, of what your uh, programs have uh, is the child care, which is kind of near and dear to my heart as well, um, the Head Start program. Can you talk a little bit about your child care programs, how many you have, you know, how many kids, you know, things like that, where you're located, et cetera? Uh, well, we have um, seven sites for child care. Uh, our biggest sites are um, right on South Meadow Road in Plymouth and at 832 Webster Street in Marshfield. Um, we do also have uh, a site in Wareham. Um, we have a small site in West Yarmouth and Dennisport. Um, and then a uh, school age um, small program in Hyannis. Um, for Head Start and um, the subsidized child care, the ages are 2.9 to 5 years, typically. Um, and there are some um, services for uh, pregnant moms and um, infants as well. Um, I believe there uh, typically are uh, over 400 slots available. And um, certainly the, uh, the pandemic has had a, a significant impact on child care uh, enrollments. Um, so there is um, plenty of opportunity for people to enroll um, either through the, the Head Start program or the subsidized fee-based child care. Um, and it'd be specific information and uh, the ability to apply right online uh, for, for those services uh, through our website. And Lisa, what are the uh, roughly the income requirements for that, for those programs? Uh, well, uh, Head Start is at 125% of income. So for example, um, it's, it's uh, a much lower income than fuel assistance. But for a household of two, that would be 21,775. For a household of four, that would be about thirty-three thousand. Um, so they, you know, that is a more, um, you know, restrictive income guideline. But there are also uh, there's also the ability to um, access Head Start services for household that ha households that have children that are disabled, um, and they are able to take a certain percent regardless of income um, if there's a disability in the household. Um, and then the fee-based is a sliding scale. Uh, I don't have those um, specific uh, dollar thresholds um, at the moment, but um, you know that information uh, is available through calling the child care centers um, or on the website. So the state program is not as limiting as Head Start would be Got because it. of uh, 
the amount of money that people make. Got it, got it. So tell me, um, either one of you or both of you, what do you see the, the biggest challenges for families you work with right now is? Well, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Safe child care during the pandemic yeah. so that they can work, it, which is a, it's a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, inflation is just unbelievable for everybody. You know, everybody is talking about their food bills these days and everything is skyrocketed. If you can find the food on the shelves, mm -hmm. It's very high priced and it's across the board. So inflation is hitting you at the gas pump. It's hitting you at the grocery store. Uh, so people are having a tough time. One of the issues I think is that people can't make enough in their wages. The minimum wage is $14.25. One of the things that we were able to do here at South Shore Community for our own employees is we implemented a living wage. The living wage for the Plymouth County is $18.09 for one adult. That means that anybody that we would hire as a pure entry level without any experience would get $18.09 as opposed to $14.25. That's about almost over the course of a year, that represents about a $7,500 difference in the amount of money that that family would make. Mm -hmm. Jack, you That's a big amount of money. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. We need to see people be able to get jobs where they're getting paid a higher rate. Right, right. No, that's a good point. Uh, I'm glad to see you taking the lead on that as well. Um, Jack, you mentioned food too. Can you just briefly talk about, I think that's what you're all known for is your food distribution. Um, how people, are, you know, what's the qualification for somebody to get food? As you said, inflation is, is going through the roof now. I think it's only going to get worse. There's going to be more needs. What's the qualification for people to get food through your food distribution center? Well, really, you know, it, sometimes they just get in touch with us and call us up and say, you know, I really need some help. And we ask them, in addition to asking them if they want to do an application, we also see if we can help them out with some food right away. And so our food distribution center, Lisa can speak to this better than I can, but I know that we did, we were averaging about 500,000 pounds in and out each year, which is a lot of meals. That's about 430 thousand meals a year uh, and with the pandemic it went up to about 600,000 was a significant increase but a lot of those go those foods go to pantries or to churches or councils on aging um, so but we also like to take care of individuals when we see there's a need and we'll give people food cards depending upon how big their family is they'll be able to go and do some shopping themselves. Uh, and Lisa, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that as far as the food program is concerned. Well, I think the, uh, the biggest thing is that um, just like all our other programs, the pandemic has had a, a drastic um, impact on the food resources program. Um, so certainly we were able to get more pounds in and more pounds out to local pantries and councils on aging. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's just been one um, you know one aspect that um, we've had impact on the number of volunteers that are uh, willing and able to work in the food resources mm -hmm. uh, distribution center um, downstairs in our building here. Um, just from a social distancing standpoint in terms of spacing, um, you know, spacing the staff and volunteers out. Um, we've had to restrict access to the pantries in terms of uh, the service model. They used to be able to come in and, and shop off the shelves, so to speak. Um, you know, all the food is, is free um, to the pantries and so forth. But um, now uh, the service model is that, um, you know, they let the uh, the staff know what it is they're in need of and the staff and volunteers shop the shelves, so to speak, for them and meet them at the door. So it's um, just like every program, there's been a, uh, a pivot in, in the service delivery model. Um, and, um, you know, we try our best to maintain and increase the services, um, but still, uh, you know, be conscious of the fact that um, we need to keep the staff and the volunteers safe um, right, right. while we provide as yeah. much service as we can. Right, right. Exactly. Jack, in the, in the last couple of minutes uh, that we have, uh, one accomplishment in your 21 years that you're proud of? 
I really am a proud that we don't really like to turn people away. If we know that there's somebody that's in need, we try to make sure that we find assistance to them. We just hate turning people away. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud of our staff. We have people that it makes, they love the work that they do. They want to help people. They try to find ways to help people in any way that they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just very satisfying to know that. And I'm proud of the fact that we were able to do the living wage. It's not an easy accomplishment to do that type of a change. Uh, when we brought that to the board of directors and asked them about it three years ago, they were like, can you do that right away? And we said, well, <laughs> wait a minute, we need to figure out how much that's going to cost and if we can budget it. And when we were able to do the work uh, to figure it out, we were able to see that we could do it and we've been able to maintain it. Yeah. It's not easy, but yeah. once you put it in your budget and you plan on it, you do it. You know, yeah. it's uh, if you're going to take care of everybody else, you got to take care of your own employees as well. Yeah. yeah. And Lisa, in the last minute we have, what, what are you looking forward to? Um, maybe not changes, but what are you looking for? for uh, yeah, maybe change is the word or, or improvements that you're looking to do for the, uh, for the organization. Well, I'm looking forward to, um, you know, to, to hopefully at some point in the very near future getting back to normal. Um, where whatever uh, that normal means. Service. Yes. <laughs> um, and I know the, uh, the, the phrase, the new normal is, is, um, you know, is overused, but, uh, certainly, um, you know, the pandemic has impacted every, every program. Um, you know, we have a big transportation program for elderly and disabled, and that's been, um, you know, had, a a huge uh, impact on service mm. um, yeah. as um, you know the pandemic continues. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to uh, normal service delivery, and um, you know uh, as we uh, try to figure out how um, we're going to um, best serve clients and families and. Um, you know, with the expanded uh, resources that um, are coming. Yeah, to and, us. and they are coming. I want to thank you both yes. for, for joining us. Real quickly, telephone number if they want to call you. 508 747 7575. Great. Thank you both very much, Jack. Thank you for your service over the last 21 years and your friendship. And uh, we'll see you out in the community soon. And Lisa, thank you. good luck. Great to be Our here. office is always thank available you, to you, Lisa, or anything you need. I want to thank you all thank at you. home for watching. We hope you found this informative and ask you to share the information of today's show with those folks who may have a need in the community. Thanks to the great staff here at PAC-TV for another terrific show. I'm Matt Miratori, and we'll see you next time on State Matters.